yeah. listening to your narrative of you know how this all of this started, you know, and how these people preyed on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, unsuspecting minds, uh, you know, owing to the situation in the north is. But some people will say that this started as a religious movement, uh, you know not preaching violence at some point. They went about their business until, you know, they began to ask for what a lot of people felt was treasonable. And then at some point, the leader was killed. And then before we no noticed what was happening, there was a pattern of attacks on security formations. Then a host of people said that they were directly against the government or trying to exact revenge from the government. But before we knew what was happening, you know, ordinary, everyday Nigerians were involved in this. Could we also say that, you know, there is uh, an attempt right now to also look inwards and see how, you know, because this group started as a pretty harmless one, that there are not other groups as well springing up, you know, with the intent of getting violent uh, as time goes on? Thank you, Thank you Maupe. You see, if you look at, as a journalist, I've studied the Northeast very well because... That's my zone. If you look at the sociological and psychological, you know, um, uh, evolution of the Boko Haram in the Northeast, you will agree with me that this group started as a religious movement under uh, one Mohammed that was killed. But unfortunately, after his death, the group has been hijacked. And it became a canker worm, kind of, that has eaten deep into the roots and fibers of these religious extremists that believe that to be able to, you know, make society governable, based on their thinking, maybe the best way is to be violent. That is why one cannot safely, there is no any literature, no, is there any historical antecedent to say as, to, as of today that the Boko Haram is under any religious guise? You can see they've been destroying so many mosques. They'll call, go to the mosque and kill people. They'll go to churches and also kill people. If you look at the aggregate number of people that have so far been killed in the Northeast, believe me, the Muslims have outnumbered any other religious persuasions in terms of numbers and figures. But again, uh, so, I, I think the question here, if you allow me coming again, is uh, the uh, yeah. participation of the people. What have they done so far? How are they helping in this uh, fight? Because now they know that they bear the brunt. They should, uh, well, lead the, the fight uh, in, in concert with the military, isn't it? Yes. Uh, thank you, Suleiman. If you look at the, uh, like in Maiduguri, the Borough State Capital, there have been this civilian JTF. And likewise, in most of the zones, especially those that have been directly affected, Yobe, Adamawa, and Boro, you find out that in almost all of these zones, the local people have been helping the military. You see the local vigilantes going to assist. But these will have their limit and limitations. They cannot be assisting with only bows and arrows or carrying sticks and daggers. The Boko Haram, they are sophisticatedly, I mean, they have sophisticated weapons. But these so called violators cannot in any way match them. But in terms of information gathering and in terms of cooperation with the military, I can say that the North is the people have been helping the military or the security agencies. But there's limitation, as I've said, to what they can do. Because they are not armed, they are not well trained to confront these people. But the military must be very serious on these responsibilities and also the government. I know they've been doing their best within the circumstances they find themselves. But there's the need for us to stand up to these people. Are we now saying that the Boko Haram, which is a ragtag, hungry-looking, religious extremist, will be able to override this country with all the military might that we have as the largest 
and also the most sophisticated country in, West, in, in, Af in sub saharan Africa, we must stand up to these people. But in the event of us not being able to conquer them in terms of warfare, what is the next option? I strongly believe that if an olive branch, just like what happened in Niger Delta, it could be sent to them to say, look, let's come and negotiate. We know we failed. We cannot conquer you. Let's come and negotiate. Then, cannot conquer you, we should negotiate. Have we failed? Look, this Boko Haram has been here since, sorry, my Boko Haram has been on since 2009. And up to the present moment, we are still fighting with them. We've not been able to subdue them or conquer them completely. I believe if there's any serious mindedness in terms of the will and capacity to fight these people, I am sure we have an army, a Nigerian army, that has the force, the might, and believe me, the psychological, you know, uh, the, the psychological balance, so to say, to go and meet these people one on one and conquer these people. Or at best, we can subdue them to surrender. But I don't think at the center there is that political will. As a journalist, I also want to believe, and one from the Northeast, that maybe there might be some political undertone. Maybe people at the center, they don't want the Northeast to participate in democracy in 2015. Maybe that's, that is one of the reasons advanced by a lot of serious-minded people from our zone. Because they know that the government at the center of the government of President Jonathan has not done anything in the Northeast. And therefore, if we are going to elections tomorrow, I can tell you out of the 10 million votes that we have in that zone, Jonathan cannot get maybe 200,000 votes. So maybe I want to believe that that is one of the issues, fundamental issues why this government is so serious in tackling this issue. If it is serious, we have the military, we have the might, and we also have the army with courage and conviction to go into this zone and subdue these people. But if they don't want us to participate in democracy, fine. Well, uh, I think the government, the but government, I uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you, you're following trends, and the government has, uh, well, a lot of times extended that same olive branch to that particular group, uh, set up a committee to also negotiate with that particular group, and uh, none of that has worked. And uh, with this military action and the state of emergency there, it would seem that, uh, well, the success is. Uh, uh, that we haven't actually recorded so far is as a result of uh, maybe collaboration uh, with a group by some people in that particular region. Uh, what's your take on that particular one? Because a lot of people are worried and say that it would seem that some people in the region are giving uh, the group some backings. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, what benefits? will these people in the region derive from sponsoring these people? I am very sure, and I want to believe, that if there's any sponsorship of these people, it might be foreign sponsorship. Because these people are killing our people. Which leader with decency, which leader with sense of responsibility will sit and sponsor people to kill his own people? If we say democracy is a game of numbers, and you know, in the Northeast, we are people that have almost the same culture, the same way of life, and the same, you know, uh, we're the same. But both Muslims and Christians, you see one family with Muslims and Christians, we are all together. We are people that be united by common destiny. So for what relevance, for what benefit will it be for anybody in the Northeast to say he is sponsoring Boko Haram, to cause mayhem, and also to kill people. Is it political? If it is political, you need a good latitude. You need a safe democratic, even the politicians, are they, the politicians that we are talking about, are they also safe? Is Boko Haram, I mean, is, is Boko Haram, uh, so anybody? No, he, he, no, anyone that comes the Boko Haram's way, the Boko Haram will kill the person. The only thing is the attire, they want to, a kind of, 
see to the reformation of the governance in terms of the puritanical narrowness. So I believe that what the zone needs at this point in time is the seriousness and conviction. The governors in the zone, they don't have the army. They don't control the army. They don't have weapons. They are not the commander in chiefs of the armed forces. And therefore, there's little or nothing they can do. The center controls everything. So if the center controls everything, it means if there's any fault, if there's any shortcoming, we are going to hold the government at the center responsible. 